Acts chapter 12, ladies and gentlemen. We're here in Acts chapter 12. If you're new to our study, we go straight through the Bible on Sundays, and we are going through the book of Acts presently. And so I'm going to read from chapter 12 this morning, the first 11 verses. Acts chapter 12, verse 1 says, Now about that time, Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church, and then he killed James the brother of John, with the sword. That means that James was beheaded. He was beheaded. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread. And so when he had arrested him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him, intending to bring him before the people after Passover. Peter was therefore kept in prison But constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. And when Herod was about to bring him out, that night Peter was sleeping bound with two chains between two soldiers, and the guards before the door were keeping the prison. Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, and a light shone in the prison, and he struck Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. And then the angel said to him, Gird yourself and tie on your sandals. And so he did. And he said to him, Put on your garment and follow me. And so he went out and followed him and did not know that what was done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. When they were past the first and the second guard posts, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them of its own accord. And they went out and went down one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. And when Peter had come to himself, he said, Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jewish people. Let's pause there and pray. Father, we're glad to be in your house. Lord, we're reminded of your word, says, I was glad when they said unto me, Let us go to the house of the Lord. It is good to come into your house, Lord, to sing your praises and now to open up your word and to study together. We pray, God, that you would bless this time in your word, that you would speak to our hearts, and that you would use this story to minister to us today. And we're grateful in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Well, if you are new to our study in the book of Acts, by the time we get here to chapter 12, persecution is in full force against the early church. The Jews who do not believe that Jesus is Messiah are persecuting Christians, as well as the Romans who are persecuting the Christians. Uh, These two have joined forces, the Jews who do not believe in Jesus as Messiah, as well as the Romans, in an attempt to not only uh, oppress and oppose Christians, but to also cancel them and to ultimately kill them. And two prominent Christ followers who have been caught in the crosshairs of this persecution against the early church are two of Jesus' hand-picked original among the twelve disciples, and their names are James and Peter. Now a little bit about these two, just so we can get the proper background on who James and Peter were. First, James, he's mentioned here at the beginning of chapter 12, and it tells us that he is the brother of John. Now, John was also one of the original 12 disciples that Jesus handpicked. These are brothers, James and John. So that means this is not the same James who wrote the epistle of James. That James is the half-brother of Jesus. This James here in Acts chapter 12 is one of the original 12 disciples handpicked by Jesus And he was the brother of John, another of Jesus' 12 disciples. Because they're brothers, they obviously share the same father. And the Bible says about James that his dad was Zebedee. Zebedee. James and John were the sons of Zebedee. And when Jesus first encounters James and John to select them as part of his original 12, the Bible tells us that these guys were just your average, ordinary, everyday fishermen. That was their livelihood. Their trade was that they were fishermen along the coast of the Sea of Galilee. And apparently, James and John had a reputation for being hotheads because Jesus nicknames them. 
In Mark chapter 3, verse 17, is the only reference to this, but in Mark 3, 17, it says that Jesus nicknamed these brothers Boanerges. Boanerges means sons of thunder. That was their nickname, sons of thunder, because apparently they just were like lightning every time something happened. They had a short fuse. I'll give you an example. In Luke chapter 9, it tells us on one occasion, Jesus was traveling with his disciples from the Galilee, which is in the northern part of Israel, to Jerusalem, which is in central Israel. And they have to pass through Samaria on their way to Jerusalem. And you remember, if, you, if you've been around very long and you know your Bibles, that there was long-standing animosity and hostility between Samaritans and Jews. So when they passed through the region of Samaria, the Bible says that the Samaritans were unwilling to give them lodging. They're turning away Jesus and his disciples. You can't stay here. We're not going to give you lodging. And so the Bible says in Luke 9, verse 54, that two of Jesus' disciples, and it names them, you can guess, two of them said to Jesus when the Samaritans wouldn't give them lodging, Lord, should we call fire down from heaven and consume them like Elijah did? Who do you think those two were? James and John, the hotheads, the thunder boys. They're like, Jesus, why don't we just smoke them? Smoke them in your name, with the love of Jesus, but let's just smoke them. <laughs> just completely destroy them. And Jesus in Luke 9, verse 54, uh, rather 55, he, it says that he rebukes the brothers and he says to them, you do not know what manner of spirit that you are. Like, you guys, you know, oy vey, you guys are like loose cannons, you guys are sons of thunder, you guys have a short fuse, just chill, relax. We're not going to smoke people today, okay? <laughs> so that's James and John. Remember these brothers also? The Bible says these were the two guys who along with their mother, their Jewish mother, which, you know, uh, the Jewish moms are proud of their sons, right? The Bible says that those two guys with their mother come to Jesus and ask Jesus, hey, when you come into your glory, Lord, can one of us sit on your right and one of us on your left? One of the gospels says that the mom actually asked the question, you know, Rabbi, these are my two boys. I'm so proud of them. One could be a doctor, one could be a lawyer, but what I want to know is, could one of them just please sit on your right and one on your left? So that's these guys. This is James and John. Now, John's not mentioned here in Acts chapter 12. John will live out his life. He will end up being inspired by the Holy Spirit to pen the words of the book of Revelation. But this is his brother James, and James is mentioned here, one of the original hand-picked 12 that Jesus selected to follow him, and James gets beheaded. We also see mentioned here in chapter 12, Peter. Now, Peter, again, is one of the original 12 disciples that Jesus handpicked, and he is probably the best known of the 12, because there's more recorded about what Peter says and does than any of the other disciples. In fact, not only does it record different things that Peter said in the course of the four Gospels, the Bible also records what Peter wrote because near the end of the New Testament, two books that he pans by inspiration of the Spirit bear his name, First and Second Peter. That's this guy. That's Peter. And so he is well known, um, more so than James. James, again, one of the original 12, but James did not write any of the books of the Bible like, like Peter did. So Peter is an interesting guy. You know, he is both um, impulsive on the one hand, and courageous and adventurous on the other. Um, his, his impulse got him into trouble at times. You know, this, this is the guy who rebuked Jesus to his face when Jesus said that he was going to be betrayed into the hands of sinners, he was going to be crucified, and, and Peter rebukes him and says, no, you won't. No, you won't, Lord. Can you imagine, like, rebuking God to his face? And this is when Jesus then responds and says, get behind me, Satan, for you do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of man. But, you know, that was impulse, Peter. Peter was the guy who spoke first and then thought second, right? You might relate to that kind of a person. Maybe you are that kind of person. You say things and then you wish you could get them back, but it's already out there. And so that's this guy. Peter is also the guy who around the, the table at the Last Supper, when Jesus predicted that all of his disciples would forsake him. Peter turned to Jesus and said, not I, Lord. 
All these other guys, all these other, my bros might, dis, might forsake you. Not me. I never will. And he uses that word never. I never will. And that's when Jesus has to look at him and say, verily I say to you, Peter, before the rooster crows, you will have denied me three times. And it is true. Peter would deny him three times. But he was just this kind of guy that was just always saying things and not really thinking it through. But again, he was also a very courageous guy. He was also a very adventurous guy. Um, he was the only one who got out of the boat. Remember when Jesus walked on water to them in the storm on the Sea of Galilee? And, and Peter said, I'm going to try that. And so he got out of the boat and he had enough faith at least to take a few steps on the water until fear set in and then he began to sink and then Jesus lifted him up and put him back in the boat. But at least he tried. At least he got out of the boat. At least he had enough courage to try to do what Jesus was doing. He was also the guy who, remember when Jesus took his disciples up to Caesarea Philippi up in northern Israel and he says against the backdrop of paganism because Caesarea Philippi was like sin city of the day and against the backdrop of all the pagan idols and the pagan gods, particularly the god Pan who was worshipped there in Caesarea Philippi, Jesus says to his disciples, who do men say that I am? What's the word on the street about my identity? And they say, well, some say that you're Jeremiah, some Elijah, some John the Baptist, some prophet of old. And Jesus says to them, well, who do you say that I am? And this is where Peter was the first one to utter the words, to make this right profession of faith. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And so Peter, though he had, you know, he was impulsive on the one hand, he was courageous on the other hand. He was bold on the other hand. Remember that after he was restored following his denial of knowing Jesus, after he was restored by Jesus, God used Peter in Acts chapter 2 to preach the first evangelical message and 3,000 people got saved that day. So God can take us with all our flaws and use us for his glory. Now, that's James and that's Peter. And in addition, James and Peter, along with James' brother John, were really part of the inner circle of Jesus' ministry. Those three were closer to Jesus than the other nine. And we know that because there are different times in the Gospels where Jesus will take those three with him to certain places of ministry that he does not take the other nine. Example in Mark's Gospel chapter 5 when Jesus went to the home of Jairus, the synagogue ruler, to heal Jairus' daughter. The Bible says that Jesus took only Peter, James, and John with him into the home of Jairus. And there performed that miracle for Jairus' daughter. You also remember in Matthew chapter 17, in the story of the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus goes up on a high mountain where he is transfigured. The glory of God comes upon him, and he just glows and beams with the pure white holiness of the presence of God. He's transfigured in that way. Along with Jesus appears Moses and Elijah. And, and who are the ones that Jesus took up? with him on the Mount of Transfiguration. He left nine below and he took only Peter, James, and John. The Bible also says in Mark chapter 14, when Jesus was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane just before his arrest and ultimate crucifixion, that Jesus is praying there in agony in the Garden of Gethsemane. Well, he had his disciples with him. But he left his disciples in one spot, and the Bible says in Mark 14, he took just Peter, James, and John with him a little further in the Garden of Gethsemane. He urged them to pray, and then Jesus went a little further by himself and prayed. And so there are different occasions when Jesus uses Peter, James, and John in, in very unique ways as part of his inner circle of three. And so James and Peter that we read about here in Acts chapter 12 are part of that inner circle. And I wanted you to have that background on, on these guys because it's important to understand these guys love Jesus, they follow Jesus, they both would ultimately die for Jesus. And as part of this ongoing persecution that has broken out against the early church at the hand of King Herod, Herod has arrested both of them, and what it tells us again is that he has James beheaded. 
James is beheaded. Now, remember in our study through Acts, Stephen was the first martyr of the early church. Stephen was the first one to die for his faith in Jesus Christ. But James is the first among the 12 disciples to be martyred. And then it tells us here in chapter 12 that Peter, on the other hand, is arrested, thrown in prison by Herod, but then God sends an angel to break him out of jail. And these two back-to-back -back stories here in Acts chapter 12 pose for us a very challenging theological dilemma. And here it is in terms of a question. Why is it that God allowed James to be executed at the hand of Herod, but he chose to rescue Peter by being delivered out of jail when God sent an angel to him. This is very challenging when you read this. I mean, it's the same Herod. And these two guys are beloved of the Lord as part of the original 12 disciples, both James and Peter. And yet one dies, one is executed, and one is rescued. And we can look at things like this and similar scenarios in our own lives, and we just kind of want to scream inside, this doesn't seem fair. And life is not fair. There are a lot of things that happen in the course of life that do not always make sense to us. And how do you reconcile the things that are, quote, unfair? particularly where it involves God and what He does for one person and what He seems to not do for another person. Things like, you know, you can have two people who are both sick and dying and you, can, you pray for one and God miraculously heals one and the other one dies. Or you can have two couples who are infertile and you pray for one couple and they get pregnant and the other couple doesn't. You have two people who need Christ, and you share the same message with them, and one responds and gets saved, and the other one says, no thanks. And these kind of, you know, what we would consider these irreconcilable things that happen in the course of life, like we see happening here in Acts chapter 12, are particularly difficult for us to reconcile sometimes, especially when it happens to us. It's one thing when we look at other people's lives or th scenarios in the world and we say, well, that seems to be fair or this seems to be unfair. Have you noticed that we tend to categorize stuff like that? That events in the world or events in our personal lives, we tend to categorize as either fair or unfair. And we do that based on our personal perspective or our personal standard. And we begin to evaluate and judge things. That's fair. That's unfair. That's fair. That's unfair. And it is particularly difficult when those unfair things affect us personally. And so I want to offer to, to you today a biblical perspective whenever you are faced with this kind of theological dilemma. The question of what do you do when God doesn't do what you want Him to do? And so four quick points. Number one, for you note takers, we need to understand that God's ways are higher, and some things will simply be a mystery to us and difficult to understand until we are with Jesus. Now listen to me, that is not a cop-out. That is reality. And we need to recognize that. If you always try to explain some of the things that are simply unexplainable, you will be digging a deeper theological pit and it would be better for you to just simply say, there are some things I don't get and I don't understand this side of heaven. Because the more you try to explain it, the more difficult and agonizing it will be. And there are some things we just need to defer to God and say, God, I don't get this. I don't understand it. And by the way, he's a big God. And you read the book of Psalms particularly, there's raw emotion there. It's okay for you to say, I don't like it. You can even say, I'm angry about it. You're a big God, Lord. I give all this to you, and I'm just going to trust you because I don't understand it. You know, in a similar way, when we put things in perspective, does a bird understand 
the one who builds a birdhouse for her? Does a bird understand the one who puts seed in the feeder and water in the bird bath? In a similar way, can we always understand the ways of the one who clothes and feeds us? We have a finite understanding of things. We are limited in our capacity to grasp and to understand. In the same way that a bird may not understand what we're doing on behalf of the bird and the big picture of things. There are many things in this universe we simply will not understand that only God does. J.B. Phillips once said, if God were small enough for me to figure out, he wouldn't be big enough for me to worship. There are just some things we have to defer to God. Isaiah 55, 8 to 9 says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways and my, ha- my thoughts higher than yours. Solomon In Ecclesiastes 8, 17, he said, Then I saw all that God has done. No one can comprehend what goes on under the sun. Despite all his efforts to search it out, man cannot discover its meaning. Even if a wise man claims he knows, he cannot really comprehend it. Some things, friends, God reserves for his understanding and his alone. In Deuteronomy 29, 29, it says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. In other words, God says, There are some things about my ways that I reveal in my word. And the things of my ways that I reveal in my word are revealed to you, for you to understand, for you to grasp, and not only for you, but for your children. But he says at the beginning of that in Deuteronomy 29, 29, that there are some things that are the secret things that belong to the Lord, and they are not searchable. They are reserved only for God's knowing. And we have to acknowledge that and admit there are some things we just simply will not understand until we are with Jesus. His ways are higher than ours. Number two, it's also important when we get into these theological, irreconcilable things. Number two is that God's nature is good. He always has our best interest at heart. Psalm 100 verse 5 says, For the Lord is good, His mercy is everlasting, and His truth endures to all generations. Let me tell you why this is so important. Because the oldest lie in the book is that God is not good. When things challenge us because we, we don't understand them, And it's easy to begin to, in our minds, think that God is not good. Because if God were good, that he would not have allowed this, or he would have answered that prayer, or whatever the thing might be. And so we tend to instantly go in a dark place, and we think, God's not good. And that's why this is happening. It's the oldest lie in the book. This is exactly what Satan did when he played with Eve's mind in the garden. Now remember, when God set up Adam and Eve in the garden, I mean, everything was at their disposal. It was like paradise on earth. It was literally everything. All their needs were met. Everything was there. God said to them, you are free to eat of any of the trees in the garden, except one in the middle, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. And what does Satan do? Satan comes along, slithering like a serpent, and he says to Eve, did God really say say, did God really say that you cannot eat from any of these trees? Now, look what he just did. He completely distorted. God had given freedom with only one caveat, and Satan turns it into legalism and says, did God really say you can't eat from any of these trees? See, what is he making God out to be? God's holding back on you. God's not good. He's denying you something. Now, Eve responds to the serpent. And Eve gets it a little bit wrong, okay? I don't know whether it was translated improperly from Adam to her or whether she's just embellishing a couple of things here. But but she says, no, there's only one tree and we're not supposed to even touch it because if we touch it, and then we're going to die. Now, God didn't say you can't touch it. He he just says you, you can't eat of it, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. In other words, literally the dying process begins. Not that they would instantly keel over, but the dying process begins. The reason why human nature is sinful is because we've inherited the sin nature now from Adam and Eve. 
and thus because all have sinned, all die. The dying process began with the human race when Adam and Eve sinned against God. Do you understand that God originally desired and designed human beings to never experience death? That was his original intent. Man spoiled God's design when he sinned against God, and then the dying process began. So Eve says to Satan, no, we can't even, we, there's only one tree, and, and the one tree that we can't touch, again, it wasn't accurate completely, but she did at least name the right tree. And Satan comes back to her, and he says, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your mind will be enlightened, your eyes will be opened. Ah, oh, God lied to you. God's holding back on you. God's not good. He's denying you something. If you eat of it, you're going to have your mind and your eyes open just like God. And so he's making God out to be a killjoy and a liar, that God's not good. It's the oldest lie in the book. So what tends to happen is when a crisis comes or some irreconcilable thing in our hearts and in our minds, we tend to gravitate towards this thought, God's not good. No, listen, that is the time you need to press into him. You need to lean into the Lord and say, Lord, I know what your word says. You are good despite my circumstances. My circumstances do not change the nature of God. He is good all the time. He is a good father who has his children's best interest at heart all the time. But sometimes when things don't look as good as we like them to be, we transfer that onto God, and that's not the case. We live in a fallen, sinful world. God loves us so much, He wanted to rescue us from this fallen, messed up, sinful world. And the Bible says in Psalm 84, 11, for the Lord God is a sun and a shield, and the Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing does He withhold to those who walk uprightly. God loves to bless His kids and take care of His kids. God is good despite our circumstances, but sometimes maybe it's just not the right timing, or sometimes maybe it's not His will, and we have to accept that. Number three, God's grace is sufficient. He will strengthen us in our weaknesses. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul laments about something that he calls a thorn in the flesh. Now, we don't know exactly what it is. A lot of people have speculated what it could be. All we know is that it was something debilitating, it was something distracting, it was something um, that he didn't like, that it was something burdensome to him. And he said, it was like a thorn in my flesh. And he said, Satan is, is behind it. Satan is buffeting me. You know, and he talked about how he had these great revelations. And so he knows that part of it was to keep him humble. But he said, God, I don't like this, what is happening to me, what I'm dealing with here. And the Bible says that he earnestly pleaded with God three times, take this from me. And God didn't. But God replied to him, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 8, Paul says, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And Paul says, therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. He says, I know, Lord, that even though this is something I want you to take, and you decided instead of taking it from me, of helping me through it that your grace is sufficient for me, and in my weakness, I feel the greatness of your power. And so, Lord, have your way. Your grace is sufficient for me. You will strengthen me in my weakness. And then finally, number four, we have to remember that God's justice is perfect. He is going to sort it all out in the end. I wonder if James's family was thinking that life was unfair when James was executed and Peter was rescued by the providential hand of God who sent an angel to break Peter out of prison. I wonder if it crossed their minds at all. Why, Lord? How come our brother James was executed and Peter was rescued? Do you think anyone in the early church at least contemplated that? Maybe dared to even say it out loud? Why, Lord, would you, 
rescue Peter, but you would allow James to be executed here. I'm sure they wrestled with that. They were human just like we are, just in the same way that we wrestle with similar things that don't make sense to us. I'm sure they wrestled with it. But at the end of the day, we have to remember that God will straighten every crooked thing and he will level every uneven thing and he will deal with every injustice and he will punish every evil. And he will, if not in this lifetime, in the one to come, deliver and rescue all his children. He will, because that's our God. The source of pain for both James and Peter was King Herod. This King Herod is Herod Agrippa I. He's the grandson of Herod the Great. Remember Herod the Great? Herod the Great was the guy that had all the baby boys murdered in the vicinity of Bethlehem trying to kill baby Jesus when Jesus was born. That's this guy's grandfather, King Herod the Great. Okay, this in Acts 12 is the grandson, Herod Agrippa I. And he's bloodthirsty just like his grandfather. So he's, he's executing, he's murdering James, he's imprisoning Peter, and he's going he's gonna to execute Peter too, except that God rescued Peter. So Herod represents, he's a type of, he's a picture of Satan and the world and all the evil and injustice attached to that that takes a toll on our lives. And look how God deals with Herod. You got to see the end of this story here. So if your Bibles are still open, Acts 12, I want you to see what happens to Herod because it's delicious. Look at this. <laughs> it's delicious. Acts chapter 12, verse 20. Verse 20 says, now Herod had been very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. Okay, that's a whole other problem he's got going with those people. But they came to him with one accord and having made Blastus, the king's personal aide, their friend, they asked for peace because their country was supplied with food by the king's country. So verse 21, so on a sad day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat on his throne and gave an oration to them. And the people kept shouting, the voice of a God and not a man. And then immediately an angel of the Lord struck him, struck Herod, because he did not give glory to God, and he was eaten by worms and died. Amen. 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 That's God getting the last word, friends. So Herod, dressed in his royal regalia, is, is you know, taking his throne, and these people, and the, the sun is glistening against his royal robes, and they start ascribing, whether they're doing it just to ingratiate themselves, or they really are deifying him, whatever the case is. They're like, you're like a God, and, and he drinks it in. He drinks it in. He doesn't give glory to God. He's a pagan, heathen murderer. He doesn't, he doesn't give glory to God. He drinks it in. And when he drinks it in and he takes the glory intended only for God, God sends an angel to strike him right there. And he dies and he's eaten by worms. Okay? Friends, God gets the last word every time. He judges Herod and he takes James and eventually Peter, who will also be martyred for his faith years later, to heaven. Okay? He judges Herod, but he rescues James and Peter. Because God always gets the last word, and in the end, he will make everything right. In Luke 3, 5 and 6, every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough ways smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Don't give up. Keep fighting the good fight of faith. Keep running the race with perseverance. Things won't make sense this side of heaven always, but one day we'll be with him forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word. For a reminder that, Lord, we don't always understand things, but you are a good God. Despite our circumstances, we trust that you are good. We lean into you as a good God. And we know that you're going to settle everything one day. In the meantime, Lord, help us to run the race. I pray especially for those who are going thing, through things right now. 
Lord, strengthen them. Help them to fight the good fight of the faith. Help them not to give up, to continue to run the race that we might receive the crown of righteousness that is in store for us, Lord. One day in your presence, we thank you, Lord, that you will make all things right. One day, Lord, help us in the meantime to stay strong in the Lord and in your mighty power, to not give in, to not give up, but to continue to run this race with perseverance. And we praise you and we thank you that you're running there with us, helping us, because he who began a good work in us will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. We give you praise and thanks in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen and amen. God bless you all. Have a great day. Amen.